Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Days of Ire Budapest 1956, which is a game that tells the real life story of the 1956 October Hungarian Revolution. And I'm going to be doing a two player run through of this today because right now the game is on Kickstarter and folks might be deciding where they want to back it and they want to know what's the game all about. Well, <clears throat> I gotta say right up front, this game is really, really interesting. It can play uh, solo, two, three, or four players, and there, it represents both sides of this conflict, the occupying Soviets and the Hungarian resistance, mostly led by students, young men and women, lots of teenagers and whatnot, uh, what are widely known as the boys of Budapest. And depending on which side you play, you play a radically, radically different game. And that's kind of the core of what makes this game special and interesting. If you are the occupying Soviets, you are, for all intents and purposes, kind of playing a version of Twilight Struggle. You have a card action system that determines what you can do, but if you play certain cards, you actually help out your opponent, and uh, everything you do is driven by the cards you have in your hand every round. And you are trying to control the board uh, in your favor because at the end of the game, the Soviets win if they've got more than four active uh, events on the board that the resistance has not been able to stop. Right now at the beginning of the game, the Soviets have one, two, three, and I should say, right now, in, in this intro gameplay run through, I'm going to be playing the role of the Soviets, which is why you're looking at the board upside down, because this is where the Soviet player sits with all of these events that they can bring about to, again, try to maintain control of the city of Budapest. Now, on the other hand, if you are playing as the resistance, you're not playing a game of Twilight Struggle or a Twilight Struggle-esque game. You're playing something more equivalent to Pandemic because you are running around cooperatively. Uh, one player can be the Soviets and players two, three, and four, or, two, or just two if you're playing a two-player, you know, player two in a two-player game, run around the board, actively try to collect the resources they need to stop these various events. Because at the end of the game, they will win if, they, if there are no more than four events on the board. Now, both sides can actually go for instant wins, depending on... Like, uh, the Soviets can instantly win if they completely crush the resistance morale. Um, the resistance can instantly win if they completely remove all of the Soviet troops, tanks, and infantry... Um, at any given time. So, there's uh, oh, multiple ways you could actually go for a win in this game. And... Like I said, we've got the board set up, the resistance, I'm going to be playing a two-player game. It's one Soviet player versus one resistance player. Here's the resistance player starting out at the University of Technology, which again is historically kind of where the resistance started. It was a bunch of students protesting that basically led to gunfire. And the, um, but if, if I were playing against multiple players, there'd be another resistance fighter over here at Corvin Passage. And if, if, that, if there were two resistance players and another one, where's the other? Oh, over here at Bem Statue, if the Soviet player were playing against three. But right now, I'm just going to be playing against one. I've got my starting hand of four cards because this is my support. J uh, Jen, the resistance player, has her starting hand of five cards. Okay. And also, uh, there are a bunch of events that I can precipitate and set into motion, but every time I, you know, which I need to do to maintain control of the city, but every time I do that, I give the resistance the opportunity to complete objectives. Now, this event deck is actually set up very specifically uh, as part of setup the, uh, to roughly follow the history of this week. So, the top of the deck is top loaded with stuff that happened early in the revolution and um, is, is less consequential. And near the bottom of the deck, things get much, much tougher for the resistance. So, <clears throat> in these early rounds, I'm probably going to be putting some events out that means the resistance could get some early wins, but I'm also potentially setting myself up long term for the end. So, how does the actual game structure work? Well, each round, and the game takes place over seven rounds that, again, represent October 23rd to October 30th, when a, in real life, the resistance had done so well and made such a huge impact that a ceasefire was called and the Soviets temporarily withdrew. But um, in this game, if the Soviets do well, that ceasefire might never happen. But anyway, so we're going to play over seven rounds. The first thing that happens every round is the Soviets have the upper hand. They take their actions. 
and I'll show you how those work. Then, in response, the resistance takes their actions, and then before the day is over, the I forget what this is called, the, uh, the SPV. Um, it's basically the Hungarian secret police, for lack of a better term, who were basically worked in lockstep with the Soviets will end every round by potentially doing some more final actions. And then that'll be the end of the first day. We we'll go to the second day and we you know, play till the end and see if enough events are still on the board for a Soviet win or if the resistance have fought them off or if we get a, uh, you know, some earlier in condition. So, how's this going to work? Well, like I said, I've got my starting hand of four cards. And now what I can do, this is the Twilight Struggle element of the game. Every card, effectively, well, it has three important elements. One, the number of command points that I, the Soviet player, can earn if I play this card. So this card only gives me one command point, and I use command points to do things like trigger these events, or move my tanks around on the board, or deploy more Soviet tanks into the city. So, uh, this, this headline card uh, will give me three command points. However, whenever I play one of these cards, I can play for the command points, so I can do a lot more actions, or I can play them for the action they do. So, if I play this, I can get three action points, or command points, or I can shift support towards the Soviet side. So, if I sp shift support for the Soviet side, at the end of this round, I'll draw five cards back into my hand instead of four. And the more cards you have, the more options you have, especially as the Soviets. So, uh, I, I think I'd like to play this, but I gotta decide. Am I gonna play this for the command points? Because I need to get these events into play so I can control the city. But these costs, let's see, they get more expensive to the right. They are randomly pulled out of this deck, and every time you play, they're gonna come in a different order. Even though they roughly follow historical order, they do come out in a different order. That makes things change up every time you play. So, over on the far left, things are at the cheapest. Um, Stalin's statue uh, would cost me three command points plus nothing. If I want to, uh, you know, if there's going to be, a, if, I, if I want to get ready for the siege at the radio, that's going to cost me four plus one. But this is a really good one because if I get this uh, event played over at the radio, which in doing this, if you know, if I take the uh, action to get this on the board, I have now set the stage where the resistance can actually lay siege at the radio. Or actually, I'm not quite certain if it's the Soviets or the resistance who've laid siege at the radio. There's actually a whole in the instruction manual. There's a story of the history that goes into a lot of the detail about what all of these actual real-life events actually meant and what the, the history was behind them. But anyway, so I can get this, but it would cost me five total events. But I'd like to do that because if I do, I can place one sniper at um, or adjacent to the radio or shift support to get even, to draw even more cards. Wow! So this turn, if I get this headline not played for the command points, but shift my support and I get Siege at the radio played, I can get my support up to six, the maximum it can be, which means I'm drawing six cards. That is well worth pursuing. So let's see here. Now, I'm, like I said, I, it's my turn. I'm just thinking about what cards I want to play. So I've got an interesting choice with this one. This card uh, would only give me one command point, or if I use it for its action, if there are six or more events on the board, shift morale towards, uh, towards me again. Now, morale is the resistance uh, track as opposed to the Soviet track. Remember, if I can crush the resistance morale early on and get them down from where they start here at 2 all the way down to 0, that's an instant win for me. And the lower their morale, the fewer cards they draw every turn. So, I mean, this would be a fantastic thing, but for this to happen, I have to have 6 events on the board. Could I actually get six events out this turn? Let's see. Well, if I save this for the you know, morale thing, then if I play these other ones, I've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's three events on the board. And so if I, get, if I get three more on, I could then play this and trigger this effect, which would, which would really set them back. So I would need to get, uh, so this would cost me three, this would cost me four, this would cost me five. So I can't afford that, but this only costs three, two plus one. So that's three, four, five, six, seven. So I could get these three out uh, if I played all of these, because I've, I've got eight total. And I say, and this one costs two, and this one costs two. Actually, I say this one, X events are minor events. Uh, you know, either the, it's a major event, which means it has a specific cost plus additional cost, or it's a minor event, which means its cost is equal to the number of other X events that are on the board. So the first one, well, this first one, if I played it, it would cost two. But then if I played the second one, it would cost two plus one, because another minor event is already active. So. I could do it, but here's the problem with this plan of you know trying to go rush in early to reduce their morale. First of all, 
it's not very hard for the resistance to raise their morale. And basically, if they ever like take out one of my tanks, their morale instantly rises. And while tanks may seem like a big deal, if the resistance has a lot of Molotov cocktails, they can take those tanks out very quickly because in the real history, the resistance, they use Molotov cocktails and similar stuff. You can see there's a picture of it on the on the cover to take out like something like 40 tanks over the course of this week. So, while my tanks are very powerful, they're also very fragile depending on what cards the resistance has in hand. But, um, but here's the other problem. To actually get enough command points to get these things out so that I could play this, I have to play these cards. All the cards are either red or green. Red means they benefit me. And if I play a card that benefits me, I either choose it for its command points or for the core action it does, one or the other. But if I play a green card, those are cards that benefit the resistance. So if I play this headline, yes, I will get three command points, which I need, which I could definitely use, but there will be something good that happens for the resistance. They will get a benefit also. So, um, you know, and as much as possible, I don't want to play these green cards. I just want to discard them because instead of playing a green card, I could just remove it from the game. So that event never happens. So I can basically shut down protests in Poland, or I could shut down uh, Peter Vares uh, reads his manifesto, which would definitely help them out. So this is my t do I do I play these, give my opponent a bit of an upper hand so that I can basically hurt their morale and maybe go for an early win, or do I take things slow? I think, because, you know, because I mean, they've got five cards. For all I know, they've got the Molotovs they need to undo the morale hit I gave them. So I don't think I necessarily want to play these cards that'll help. Although, although, here's the. Well, this is interesting. This headline, um, basically, if I do this to get the three command points, one injured player can draw two of their own action cards, their revolutionary cards. Here's the thing they're not injured. So if I play this for my command points, it won't help them because they're not injured right now. But that means this card is only worth one command point instead of three. So right now I could play this for one and basically give them nothing. So actually, I think I do want to play this right now uh, because since I have failed to injure them. So that means, I, but, but unfortunately, I'm only getting one command point. And what I, I think what I'm either going to try to do, I'm going to try to get all these out, or I'm just going to try to get this five out um, because it'll give me this action and it'll be my fourth event. See, I don't have to get all my events out all at once. I could spend a few turns building up. And while I'm going, I could build up my defenses because, once again, once I put an event on the board, that's a target for the revolution to come. So, uh, for the resistance to come. So, I do need to protect them. So, but I'm definitely going to play this because it only gives me one. And. Hmm. So that'd be one, this would be, uh, so that'd be four. So this isn't actually three. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. Now what's this good event for the resistance? All players move to an adjacent location or discard one card to move anywhere. And uh, those moves can include active fighters. All right. So basically, if I play this to get two command points, Jen over there will get to make one move. And now, moving is what she does all the time anyway, so really all I'm doing is giving her one extra action in case she wanted to move over here to Bem's statue because she's got the card she needs to deal with this event. And so, I mean, normally she'd have to spend one of her actions to move over here. All I'm doing is letting her move for free. That's not that big a deal. So, um, heck, if I play the... So that's six total, but that's not what I needed. So actually... Because she's not, I, I, I didn't realize this headline isn't worth three. I can't actually go for the big one. If I play these two things, she gets to move once, and I get to, uh, I, I get to, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play both of these cards. So, when I play a red card, I declare whether I'm using for the command points or for its action. I'd love to switch my uh, morale, but you know what? Or my support. But I'm going to be able to do that once I get this siege out as well. So I'm playing this not for. Although, yeah, if I do that, let's see. So if I, I do that for that, that's no. I, I only have four total with my other cards. So I'm, I'm playing this for the command points, and I'm playing this, and, and which means this doesn't happen now. There's a third thing on these cards. The SPA, that's what it is. The secret police is the SPA. This is saying that I could recall an SPA card, but I can't do that right now because I haven't played any SPA cards. So I'm going to ignore that. Uh, let's see. Then, so I'm playing this. And now in response, Jen gets to move one character, which is the only one she's got, one space, or she could discard a card to move anywhere. And so to decide where she's going to move, I haven't even looked at what her cards are yet. 
What does she got? Well, now she needs to be thinking about, should she move over here to BEM if she has what she needs to shut this down, which is to uh, basically organize a protest at BEM statue. She needs communication equal to the number of events on the board. There's only three events on the board. How many communications cards does she have? Well, I'm not supposed to know what she's got, but uh, communication is not her strong suit right now. She doesn't really have a lot. So coming over here doesn't really help her. Although if she comes over here, there's two things she could do. She could try to go for this event, which again, she does not have the cards she needs right now. She'll have to collect those more communication cards to be able to organize a uh, protest. Or she could come here to activate this fighter. And you can see every one of the areas has two fighters that are waiting to be activated. And these fighters give the resistance player who is leading those fighters extra powers, extra icons that let them deal with events, and extra powers that they can spend actions on. So the resistance player, their main thing is moving around, trying to fight events, and trying to whip up support amongst the populace and you know, basically mobilize people so they become fighters to help in the cause. So, but still, can't do Bem's statue. Let's see, for, to basically do the uh, initiating events, students, you know, for them to release their demands, they need communication and they need food, which would also shift their support, uh, which would undo my support. Um, so that, you know, right now, going from four, it wouldn't hurt me, but if she could support, reduce my support again, I'd only be drawing three cards every turn. So she'd like to do this, but she needs two food and a communication. And now she doesn't have that either, does she? No. But, oh, but look at this. If, she, if, if Jen activates uh, Ermi uh, Collins, and by the way, I should say, all of these fighters, they are not real people. They are kind of represent real people, but these are made up names. If she activates this fighter, that this person can generate two food for her. That would be two of the three foods she needs for this. And if she looks over here, uh, Zoltan uh, Bizu, he also generates food as well as an action. And, you know, the action is can basically shift the morale and Jen might need to control her morale. So, I think, I think, yeah, Jen gets a free move because of the card I played. The uh, Peter Varys reads his manifesto. That spurs her to action. She's going to get her free move and come over here. All right, so that's her plan. So we played these. Now I can go on ahead and spend my command points. And I'm, all five of them are just going to go towards four plus one. Now if I waited, this thing could slide over here and become only four points instead of five right now. But I'm going to get this deployed right now. So, I have, uh, at the radio, created a new event. Now, for Jen to stop this, she needs two communication, two Molotovs, and uh, gunfire, gunpower, equal to the number of events on the board. And there are now four events on the board. So, this is a tough thing for her to take care of or, or immediately, early in the game. Um, plus, I've just made this tougher because now there are four events on the board instead of three. So, that's it. I've spent those. But she... Mm, mm. Since she moved here, I, I'm tempted to actually now, because she do, to play this, which um, won't let her do anything because she's not injured, but it will give me one more command point. I am going to play this right now instead of discarding it to get rid of it. So I get one more command point. She said she's not injured. She doesn't get anything. And in addition to spending command points to deploy events, because I, I well, here's the thing. The only event I could of my remaining ones that I could deploy would be on a Blah Lucia Square. But I cannot play this unless Stalin's statue removed is on the board. So until I play this event, I cannot play this event. But there are other things I can spend my command points on manipulating my tanks. I can spend one command point to move my tank from one region to an adjacent region. So if I suspect Jen is coming over here to Astoria to get this person, She's now going to have to deal with my tanks. I can spend one to move a tank. I can spend three action points to deploy another tank on the board. And you can see, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six tanks waiting in the wings. I had this one that started out over by the radio station and this one over uh, in the square, but I can put more out. And so, I'm going to move on Jen. Now, my tanks don't directly attack. My tanks are very much a defensive measure. They don't do anything unless they're in an area where the re revolution tries to do actions. If Jen's going to try to recruit this person, my tank is blocking her way now. Okay, so that was it. Now, I've still got one more card I could play. This would give me one more command because I don't have six events on the board. I could, and one more command would let me move another tank. I mean, heck, if I wanted, I could move my other tank from the square boom, all the way over here, and then there's two tanks. But I'm not going to bother with that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're just going to leave that alone. 
I'm going to save this for later and play this once I've got six or more events on the board so I can increase my morale. But I forgot. When I played this, place it, uh, yeah, I, I got to, I, I forgot. There's actually a couple more things about this. Place one sniper at or adjacent to radio or shift support. So originally, I had intended to shift my support one so I'm drawing five cards instead of four. But, this is interesting. Instead of doing that, which is my original plan, Jen's kind of moved over here. I could deploy a sniper into the radio or into an adjacent space. So I've got two more snipers. And now with these snipers, I could directly attack. And snipers are the biggest problem for Jen. Jen can basically take out my militia pretty easily. She can take out my tanks without that much trouble. But my snipers are very, very difficult to deal with. So I could do that, but then I'm only drawing four cards instead of five. And the more cards I have in my hand, the more powerful I am. But this would be a chance for me to get an early blow because provided, you know, Jen, after I'm done with the Soviet, Jen is going to take her turn. She's going to get to do four actions. After that's over, the, uh, what's it, the SP, I keep forgetting the names of the secret police. The secret police get to do their stuff, the, the SPA. And um, that means I could move snipers around, I could move my militia around, I could place more militia on the board, and I could open fire if uh, any of the SPA forces are in the same area. Now see, you'll notice, I do not have the option to deploy more snipers. Snipers are arguably my most powerful unit. I can move them once they're on the board, but I'm wondering if maybe instead of moving support, I should take advantage of this chance to get a sniper on the board, because, you know, I mean... <sighs> Okay, I think I'm going to do that. If Jen hadn't moved here and kind of stepped right into a spot, but since she did, I'm going to go with that and not increase my support, which was my original plan. All right. So, uh, and that's what the radio. And, so, and I could put the sniper over here, so I've got two snipers supporting, you know, covering this radio in case there's going to be a siege there. But if I do that, I mean, and, and, and that really helps me protect this so it's even more dangerous for Jen to come here. But I don't think she's going to come here right now because it's unlikely she's got enough cards to do that anyway. So I'm going to put them right there and uh, you know strike back and maybe uh, draw some early blood on the resistance. So my last action, I'm going to hold this in my hand. So now at the end of the Soviet player's action in a given round, only two of the events remain. So I've got to jettison three of these five events. And then the remaining slide down, become cheaper, and then new ones come out. <sighs> Let's see. So, um, this they need a lot of communication. It doesn't help me at all. But this is, this is an event I can put anywhere. Most of them, you have to put them in specific places. I can uh, spread the news to the countryside. Or, or basically, I'm sorry. I'm not actually doing these events. These are things that the revolution gets to do. But I can do an event that gives the resistance the chance of spreading news to the countryside. I can put this anywhere. And I could try, I mean, heck, I could put this over here in the square, or over here in Cossack Square, which means it's protected by snipers and a tank. And, um, you know, because maybe otherwise, I don't have any cards I can place directly there. But do I want to keep that, or do I want to keep this? Stalin Square and Blood Square, these are kind of a one-two. They work in concert with each other. Um, so, I mean, I, I, get both, I, I get these two things out um, for only four, because they, you know, they're already cheap. You know, I think I'm going to keep both of these, which means I'm going to discard all these. So these are out of the game, and now new events come out. Uh, students distribute food at the University of Technology, which lets them draw two cards if they complete. And this is a really easy thing for them to do. They just need one transportation to pull that off. Uh, government uh, building occupied anywhere. This lets them activate, activate a fighter. All right, this is a specific one. Defense of the Ironworks in uh, Seppel, Seppel. And fighter group organized on Sands Square. Right, okay, so that's my new stuff. And I draw cards again. And I did not, I don't get to draw five like I'd originally hoped because I, you know, the situation changed. So I'm just going to draw four. One. Nope, not event cards. Silly me. One. Now, we're in the early game. So in the early game, I'm drawing from the red deck. In the second round, I could draw from the red or the white deck. And then when we get later on, it's for the white deck. And then uh, towards the end, I can be drawing from the white or the green deck. And these, again, represent the changing tide that happened over these, uh, over this week. So anyway, one, two three, four. So I've drawn up four cards, and that was it for me. Now it is the resistance turn, and the way the resistance works is they get to do, they, they have their hand of cards, which is 
over here. They've got their hand of cards and they get to do a certain number of actions. Now, it doesn't matter how many players. It, it, since there's one player, that one player gets to do four actions. If there were two players who had started out, Two actions here, two actions here. No matter what, the resistance always gets four actions every turn to be split any way they might. If it's a three-player game, one of them gets one action, one of them gets one action, and one of them gets two actions. And it's entirely up to them as a group to decide. Because you got to imagine, if there were actually three, if, if, if it were the single monolithic Soviet player against three resistance players, like I said, they're playing a game of, of a cooperative game similar to Pandemic. They're running around the board, spending actions, trying to get access to special powers, and shut down events, which is key for them winning, and fight off you know, the Soviet influence and the secret police. So that's what they're doing. And they would be discussing as a group, right, okay, well, uh, you know, saying, hey, you know what, um, we only need four communication. I've got two communication. Can somebody come over here and join me so that we can all together work on this at BEM Square and complete this and get this off the board? And, you know, they, you know, and she'd say, well, uh, I've got one, and he'd say, I've got none. But then they'd say, well, wait a minute, is there anybody we could activate who has access to communication? And, you know, this guy over here. So if one of us came over here to activate this guy and then brought him, he gives us access to food and communication, then we'd have enough. But do we have enough actions spread amongst us to be able to get over here, pick this guy up, bring him here, and then, you know, so that's the kind of discussions that the resistance player is doing. Now, I should say, in the extended playthrough, I am going to actually turn this board around 180 degrees and play the second round of this game entirely from the resistance point of view. So you'll get to see a little bit more about this thought process that goes into that. Um, but for now, I'm mostly still keeping this run through from the point of view of the Soviet. The Soviet has no idea what the resistance is doing, has no idea what these cards are in their hand. So. Let's see. And now, here's the thing. Although I did kind of talk a bit, what I was thinking the resistance was going to come to is recruit Zoltan, bring him back over here, and get University of Technology event completed. Now, that's still a valid thing to do, particularly because they'll be running away from these snipers. But to do any action in Astoria runs the risk of running afoul of tanks. And that's where the dice come in. Every time a tank or it's one of the places the dice come in. The tank uh, you roll has a 50-50 chance. A 1, 2, or 3 means the tank will actually do damage if the resistance player goes on ahead and activates this inactive fighter. Now, I think Jen's going to take a chance and do it anyway. Now, the resistance, they have acts, they have seven, they, they get to do four actions, seven different types of things they can do. They can activate fighters in the zone where they are. They can shut down an event if they've got all the icons they need to do it. They can directly open fire on militia and try to take them out. Remember, one of their wins is get all the militia and all the tanks off the board. Actually, I didn't look. Do they have... Because there's a tank right here. Maybe they should blow up that tank if they've got the Molotovs they need. Let's see here. I didn't actually look for that. All right. So, uh, th so they can attack militia. They can attack tanks. They can, um, if, if they have a fighter following them that says, spend an action to do an ability, like, are there any, uh, like this guy. If they have... Um, Ilona K uh, Keck following them around, they can, it's uh, obviously, she's a medic. And they can use one of their actions to remove an injury. So that's pretty handy to have that person following you around. So they can use their fighters. They can, um, if they're in this, if, if they're playing multiple, they can use an action to trade cards back and forth, which can be really important to their logistical game. Or they can use actions to draw more cards. They can just spend all four actions and draw four more cards in their hand. But I think they're going to stick with their original plan. First thing of their four actions the Jen is going to do is activate this uh, person, which means... The, um, that comes off. The active is now, we find out who the other person is. At per oh my gosh, who provides communication and is another action, shifts support towards the resistance, but they're inactive. So they've done an action in this area, which is um, getting this person. Now, because they've done an action, if they had done anything in this area with the tank other than simply move away, um, and by the way, I should say, moving does not take an action. When, I mean, they get to do four actions. Before they do an action, they could move. So she could have moved and then done an action over here and activated this person and gotten a Molotov cocktail and maybe started coming to chase after my tank. But they didn't move. They, they have a free move option they can do. And after they move or stand still, they can do an action. She stood still. She did an action. And now because she's done an action where there is a tank present, the tank gets to fire. A one, two, or three means she takes a point of damage. It's a six. So, the, um, you know, she had a 50-50 chance. It worked out well. My tank failed. And now for her second action, well, before she does her second action, she's going to move. And whenever they move, they can pull up to two active fighters with them. 
man, I have to admit, she's now tempted because that fighter, if she could do a second action, get this guy, then, um, because it, no, but she, or she's planning on coming back here to activate this because that's one, two, three, and spoiler alert, she does actually have a communi she has an aid card, which is a communication card, so she'll be able to get this done. She'd love to bring this community because then that means she wouldn't have to use this communication, but she wants to get this shut down now. Plus, she doesn't want to, if she tries to activate this guy, she'll come under fire from the tank again. So, her first thing is she's going to do an action over here, which means she gets a move. Now, whenever they move, they get to move one space for free and they can move additional spaces by discarding cards from their hand. Fortunately, she only needs to move one, so that was totally free. She brought this fighter with her. Now, for her second action, she is going to activate this fighter. All right, which means we've got another one down here who needs to be activated. There can't be more, if I recall correctly, than four active fighters in a given zone. But anyway, so now she has access to one, two, three food. She needs four food and a communication. So that was her second action. Right, her first action was activating this. Her second action was activating that guy. Now her third action will be to shut this down and so she did have time. She could have activated this guy and brought them both back. Plus she'd have, oh, because she was just planning on using this aid to do the communication. And then her fourth action would be to draw another card back. And she would have shut this down. She's got her little troop there. No, no, no. Okay, no, she's fine. She's got her third action is going to be to basically issue student demands at the University of Technology, which means she needs one communication. She doesn't have access to it. She will play this aid card, which could be played for communication first aid, or food, depending on what you want to play it as. And so that's the communication plus the three food means she has successfully, the students have issued their demands. And the reward for completing this is support shifts one. So, whoops, uh, sorry, support shifts. Now that doesn't, I'm still drawing four cards, but if it shifts again, I'm only drawing three cards. So now I'm regretting not having gotten my support farther up because it, well, anyway. So she has completed that, that's done. And she has one more action for her final action. And remember, before her action, she could move for free if she wants. <clears throat> so she could move over here, and her final action could be to open fire on these militia if she's got cards that would take them out. And that's interesting. Um, basically, she needs one bullet card to take out a single militia. If there were three militia here, she'd need three cards with bullets on them. And you know, some of the followers actually provide those bullets as well, like this guy is ready to fight militia. You know, the, the secret police. But whenever possible, if Jen's going to take out Militia, she wants to take out three at a time. Because in one action, if she can take out three Militia, then their morale increases. The same way their morale increases if they take out a tank. So I don't think Jen's really that interested in running over here just to take out one guy. Instead, her final action, she's going to stand still. She's not going to move. And she's going to activate Zoltan's uh, ability, which is shifts her morale. And so she is now drawing three cards instead of two. So that was those were the four actions of the resistance, and so at the end of the turn, they get to draw three cards. One, two, three. All right, and so now it's my turn, and because remember, the first thing that happens is the Soviets move, then the resistance move, then the Hungarian secret police move, and that's where these cards come in. They're all publicly displayed. I could activate every single one of these cards if I wanted to, or I could activate only a few of them. The, it's interesting, the way they work is, <clears throat> Basically, um, the more of these I activate, they go into a queue, first in, first out. So if I decide, because I could do this, since I've got this sniper on the board, who I brought out to chase her, maybe my first action is, I'll move snipers. Which is, move one sniper to an adjacent location, these snipers could move over here. And now, I mean, heck, if I wanted, I could play a second move sniper and a third move sniper, so all my snipers have moved. So this guy could go one, two, and now I have deployed my snipers to the university. And then, my, uh, and then after that, I could attack, which means I select a location with SPA troops in it, say this one, and I roll a die. And it's interesting, I want to roll low because I could successfully get one or potentially two hits. Let's see. Now, if I want to push even further before I do this attack, I could move Militia. And now that lets me move, uh, do up to three moves with Militia. Actually, so I was thinking I can move this guy over here. Yeah, so let's, let's move some Militia while we're at it. So I'll move some Militia, and I get up to three moves. So this Militia, everybody, they issued their demands. The Soviets did not care for that. And so they are coming down 
to lay down the iron sickle, basically. So everybody has moved over there. I have now a sizable force that is has the potential to do two points of damage, which is big. The Another way that the Soviets can win at any given point is to do a certain threshold of damage to the resistance, to basically take a resistance fighter out. Since I'm only playing against one resistance fighter, they're tough. They've got five. The more resistance fighters there are, the weaker they are, the easier they are for me to just outright kill them, which would be an instant win for me because the morale closes. So, and now that I, let's see, also while I'm at it, heck, I could go on ahead and place militia, put two militia um, in one of my three Soviet deploying areas. What the heck, I will, I'll pay that too. Uh, and I'll put them over here so that next turn they could maybe move up here to, to protect the radio or move over here to protect Corvin's Passage where there's another event I have to make sure they can't do. Um, oh, now, if I wanted, heck, I could move militia again. I could move these guys in and really put the hurt on them. But I think I've done enough of that. So the last thing I'm going to do is I am going to attack. So I've used almost every single card. Now, this is kind of overkill because what this means is in a future round, in round two, I am only going to have access to move militia and attack because all these other ones are spent. But remember how I was saying that some of my headline cards have this little SPA? When I play them, this gives me the opportunity to pull a card back. I could pull the fir it's for first in, first out. If I had played this, I could pull the lowest card back and get access to it again, which means I could move snipers again. So this is a whole other game of trying to manage the... Uh, the secret police, so that you can do multiple turns. Because instead of um, using cards, because in the next round I've only got access to two, heck, maybe I'll have access to move some snipers as well, and I could have my snipers keep chasing Jen. Alternatively, I could pass on doing the secret police turn, which means I get to recall all of them, and they're all in my hand again. Now, I've made a big, big push, and finally I'm going to attack. And it says right here what to do. Uh, roll two dice for hits, or if strength is nine, shift morale towards stars. Uh, wow, I didn't think about that. Strength of this group is three, six, seven, eight. If I just move one more over here, my strength is nine. Instead of doing damage, my strength could be so overwhelming that I would intimidate the resistance, which basically pushes their morale down. And remember, if I get their morale down to nothing, that's an instant win for me. But the thing is, I have just put a whole bunch of guys... Well, I mean, Jen, she needs a very special card called an ambush card to take out my snipers, but... The thing is, if I move another guy over here, I've got three, um, um, what do you call it, uh, three militia. If Jen can take out those three militia in one turn, that pushes her morale back up. So I don't know if I necessarily want to take that chance. So I'm, I'm done with that. I'm going to attack. Uh, and so I roll dice twice. I roll. And provided my first roll is uh, less than the total, which it's going to be because I, ca I can't roll an eight. That's going to be a hit. And I roll a second die. And... If the, uh, so this was definitely a hit. I roll a second die. If the sum of both of these dies is less than my total strength, that will be a second hit. So my strength is eight. So as long as I roll, as long as I don't roll a five or a six, I'll actually get two hits instead of one because I've deployed such a huge force. That's a two, so that's a six. So this was a hit. And a four was less than my total strength, so that's a hit. A six is less than my total strength, so that's a hit. So now Jen has a choice of how to take that damage. She could personally take the damage, but remember, if she takes too much, if she takes five in a, a solo or you know, a single resistance fighter game, she instantly loses. Instead, she could have her followers take the damage. These people could die to protect her. But, I mean, I don't think she wants to give these people up. So, Jen's going to be brave and noble. She's going to take two of the five damage that she is allowed. And so that's kind of scary. Now, remember, I mean, if she can get up here so she can find good old Enola over here, she can start using actions to heal herself. Plus, she, she might have cards in her hand that let her heal herself. So, it's a bit risky because I could go for a quick win just by chasing her down. But anyway, that was it. So, the SPA, or the, yeah, the SPA is done. And that, folks, was the first of seven rounds and of in Days of Ire, Budapest, 1956. And now, if you'd like to see how the other half plays. I'm going to play the second round. Uh, what it means I'm going to turn this entire board around. So we're playing from the resistance point of view. And I haven't mentioned this. I should have mentioned this right up front. This game is very interesting. You can play a player, or, you know, a one versus team situation, like what I'm talking about here, or Days of Ire can be a 100% co-op player, where the resistance fighters, one, two, or three resistance fighters, work cooperatively not to play against a human-controlled you know, a, a player-controlled Soviet army, but instead an AI-deck-controlled army. 
Uh, General Zhukov here was the commanding officer in Budapest at this time, and these are a whole bunch of cards that can determine Soviet strategy. So, you can buy Days of Ire as a fully cooperative game. And in the extended, I am actually going to get rid of all these event cards and get rid of, of a lot of what you've seen, and I'm going to show you how this plays from the point of view of resistance as a co-op game as we continue round two. So if you want to see that, hit the I in the top right corner of the screen to go to the extended playthrough, or you can go to Final Thoughts just to hear um, some final thoughts in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.